And you could tell from this image right here, I don't know if you could tell, this is a kidney. And the kidney has some anatomy to it, I'll go over. This is the capsule of the kidney out here. It's a very thick fibrous structure and the capsule does not allow the kidney to expand very much. And so when somebody has a blockage of the kidney, like a kidney stone, there's really nowhere for the kidney to go to expand. And so that's why people get excruciating colicky pain with kidney stones. It's because of this capsule, this thick structure out here. Coming in from the capsule, we have the cortex. This material back here, this very um, isoechoic material here is the cortex of the kidney. This is where all the nephrons are. And the nephrons take the blood that's coming into the kidney through the renal artery, they filter it, and they send the blood back to the rest of the body through the renal vein, and they take the blood and they filter out the urine and put it here in this pyramid. And so, so you've got the cortex, and then you've got the pyramids, and in the pyramids, they look like they're basically black or anechoic because they're full of fluid or urine, and that's why they, they, they're, uh, they look black. And so then these pyramids, they all coalesce and drain into the renal pelvis, or sometimes this is called the sinus of the kidney. And here, this is why it's anechoic, because there's more fluid coming there, and then eventually they exit out the kidney and into the ureters. And the ureter comes down one from each kidney, they come down and they enter into the bladder in the back of the bladder. And you don't see the ureters very well in ultrasound because the ureters are uh, covered by bowel and fat and things like that. So they're really hard to see, they're very small usually. Unless they're dilated, then you can see them. So once the ureter kind of exits the kidney, we no longer see it. This is a schematic diagram of the kidney. You can see that capsule structure out here. You can see the cortex here where all the nephrons are. They drain into these pyramid structures that are full of urine that eventually coalesce into this renal pelvis, sometimes called the renal sinus, and then that drains down the ureter into the bladder. Now, the kidneys are located obliquely in the abdomen, and it turns out that the left kidney is more posterior and more superior, and the way I remember that is that um, the left kidney is more towards the head and more towards the bed. And it turns out that the renal cortex is less echogenic than the liver or the spleen. And the renal pyramids, because they're filled with urine, are less echogenic than the cortex. So if you want to turn that in terms of brightness, the, um, the liver and the spleen are brighter than the kidney's cortex, but the kidney's cortex is brighter than the liver, uh, uh, than the, um, than the uh, renal pyramids. The renal pyramids are less echogenic than the cortex. And the sizes are a little bit different in males and females. The kidneys are slightly larger in males, about a half centimeter or so bigger in males. And then the uh, right kidney is actually smaller than the left kidney. You can see there that the right kidney in a male is about 11.3 centimeters, whereas the left kidney in the male is bigger, 11.5 centimeters. Same thing with the females. They get a little bit bigger on the left side. Why do you think the left kidney is bigger than the right kidney? Uh, kind of. It's because, do you know where the, the aorta lies in relation to the kidney? So the aorta travels out of the heart and then down the spine. Which side of the spine does it travel down? The left side or the right side of the spine? It comes down the left side of the spine. And so the left kidney being closer to the aorta, it gets more of a direct blood supply, so it gets a little bit bigger over time. And so that's why the, the left kidney is bigger than the right kidney. It's closer to the aorta. Now, if you look at this image here, what did I do in terms of depth? Uh, what did I change here on the screen? What's the difference between these two images? They have the same depth. They both range down to 17 centimeters. But what's different about these images? The gain. So the, the right image here is overgained. It's, um, it's pretty washed out, like you got to wear sunglasses to look at it. Whereas the left image over here, it kind of gets back to what I was talking about. See the cortex of the kidney here? It's less echogenic or slightly darker than the liver is. And if you can make out those subtleties, you've got your gain adjusted just right. That's the art of gain. Over here, it, they kind of wash out together here. It's hard to tell that the cortex is less echogenic than the liver is here. So that's why it's kind of a measure I use of gain. I know I've got my gain set right when my kidney's cortex looks darker than my liver or the spleen does. Does that make sense? All right. So. Um, if you look at where the probe is, I want you guys to look here where the probe is. This probe is in a parasagittal right axis. What does that mean? Para means next to. Sagittal means um, anterior longitudinal. Uh, 
anterior approach to the longitudinal plane. And so this is sort of the midline of the body right here. If I come just to the right of midline, that's where I'm gonna see this vessel right here as it kind of courses underneath the liver. So what vessel is that? Good, that's the IVC. And the IVC <laughs> runs up the right side of the body, okay? The way the aorta runs down the left side of the spine, the IVC runs up the right side of the spine, bringing blood back towards the heart. And so the next question is, um, if this is anterior over here, so the probe is on the skin line here anteriorly, and then the sound is going down towards the back posteriorly down this way, okay, so this is posterior down here, what vessel lies posterior or behind the IVC yet perpendicular to it? Do you see how the IVC is here in its long axis, but this vessel here is round or in its short axis? So what do you think that vessel is? It's the RRA, very good, the right renal artery. So what's happening is the blood is trying to get from the aorta, which is on the left side of the body, all the way over to the right kidney on the right side of the body. The way it does it is that it goes behind the IVC. So that's just a landmark we see a lot on ultrasound. Now we're gonna turn the probe into a transverse plane. Okay, so we went from parasagittal right, we take the indicator, we aim it to the patient's right, now we're in a transverse plane. We're getting a cross section of the body. And so the first thing I look at is this right here. This is the spine shadow, okay? That's where the sound encounters the spine. It can't go any further and bounces back up towards the probe. Okay, so in going from posterior to anterior, I'm gonna name all these structures. So number one structure here is the spine shadow, okay? Now I'm gonna move anterior. This is the left side of the spine. Remember, in a transverse view, Everything over here is to the patient's right. That's the side the indicator's on. That's where we aim to the patient's right. It's as if we're standing below the patient's feet, looking up into their body. Therefore, this vessel right here is to the left of the spine shadow. What do you think it is? That's the aorta, as you can tell, clearly outlined in this diagram here. Now, <laughs> what do you think is left of, I should say right of the spine shadow then? That's the IVC. So if this is the aorta, this is the IVC right here. Now, moving anteriorly, what vessel is this right here? It's bringing blood out to the intestines. It's a branch off the aorta. It's called the SMA, or superior mesenteric artery, and it looks like a mantle clock over here. Now, realize that you guys haven't had anatomy yet. I totally appreciate that, and I know I'm kind of getting the cart before the horse, but you're gonna learn it eventually. You may as well get a taste of it. This is the mantle clock, which I, this is the superior mesenteric artery, which I think looks like a mantle clock. Now. Look at this anechoic structure crawling over the mantle clock. You see that there? That's the splenic vein. The splenic vein is taking blood from the spleen, which is over here somewhere on the left side of the body, and bringing it back to eventually, it combines with the superior mesenteric vein to make the portal vein, which then empty into the liver and get filtered by the liver. So that's where that splenic vein is trying to go become the portal vein eventually when it meets up with superior mesenteric vein. Again, I realize you haven't had that anatomy yet, but you're gonna start to see all these things on ultrasound really soon, so I think I should point them out. Outside that splenic vein, that's the pancreas over here, and then above here, this is all the liver. So I'll trace the margin of the liver as it comes around here, and then, boom, there's the pancreas there. So, if we look between the aorta and the SMA, there's this blood vessel that gets nut cracked between those two vessels and then dumps into the IVC. So what blood vessel do you think gets nut cracked between the aorta and the SMA that then drains its blood into the IVC? Left renal vein, very good, LRV. Excellent, you guys are getting good, you guys are good at this. So here's the left kidney, not seen on the screen, it's like over here on this side of the body somewhere is the left kidney, and then it's blood supply, sort of analogous to on the right side of the body where we just were, how the right renal artery had to go behind the IVC to get to the right side of the body, well, on the left side of the body, the left renal vein has to get over to the right side of the body to drain into the IVC. The way it does that is it gets nutcracked between aorta and SMA and gets into the IVC. Cool? All right. Now, when you look at the kidneys, you want to think about the upper and the lower poles, okay? And the way I think about it is kind of like upper means towards the head or superior, and the lower pole means down towards the feet or inferior. And in between the upper and lower poles is the mid pole. That's really all you gotta know. 
you can look at them in their long axis, and then you want to flip the probe 90 degrees and look at them in their short axis. And you basically just sort of assess the whole system for its architecture, its echogenicity, its shape, its contour. You know, you don't have to worry so much about the pathology this year. That's really for next year. But eventually you're going to be looking for problems in the collecting system, the cortex, and cystic structures, and solid masses, and diffuse disruptions in the kidney, things like that. Now, the next video you're going to see is pretty funny because it's me about six years ago when I had more hair. Now, if we talk about the renal scan, the renal scan, you pretty much did one during the FAST exam, but you come over here, and you basically, you get a nice coronal view here of the kidney. You, you can actually get the, the kidney upper pole and lower pole on the screen at the same time here, and a long axis, and if you rotate the probe 90 degrees, you can get a short axis of the kidney, rotate the probe towards the ceiling, you get a short axis of the kidney, fanning through. You always want to fan through an organ in both both its long and short axis. I didn't mention that with the gallbladder, but you want to do that with the gallbladder too. You want to fan through the gallbladder its long and short axis, but that's the kidney's long axis. Rotate the probe 90 degrees, there's a short axis. And again, on the left side, it's the same thing. Indicators towards the patient's head to get that long axis on the screen, and then to get a short axis, you rotate it towards the ceiling. Okay? All right, so now on that right kidney, there's really a, um, a couple ways to look at the look at the kidneys. You can come from the side of the body, which we call coronal, okay? And there we are approaching it from the side of the body. And sometimes you get really good views of the kidney just straight off the bat looking coronally. Occasionally though, you gotta take the probe and drag it up anteriorly, up here. But whenever you drag the probe anteriorly, keep in mind the kidneys are still kind of a posterior structure, so to kind of compensate for dragging the probe anteriorly, you're gonna wanna also fan the probe in uh, posteriorly, okay? So I'll say that again. From the coronal view, you can drag the probe up anteriorly, and then you're going to kind of tilt the cable towards the ceiling. And by doing that, you're going to be fanning the probe, the sound, shooting the sound more posteriorly. And actually, many times, that anterior approach, using the liver or the spleen as your window to see into the kidney, is actually a better way to go than even a coronal view. Every patient's different here. This is the art of sonography we're kind of dabbling in right now. Did you have a question? No? Okay. Now, once you, if you can't get lucky that way, you can then roll the patient decubitus. This is called left lateral decubitus. Decubitus means on their side. You roll the patient on their side, and you can look between the ribs and see from a posterior approach the kidney sometimes a little bit better. Every patient's different. You can see here, this is what the anterior or coronal approach looks like. We're getting along the liver as our window to see the kidney. And then as we go more uh, posterior, we actually see another structure behind the kidney. That's called the psoas muscle, and it lies right on top of the spine. So spine, psoas, kidney, liver. This is the upper pole of the kidney, more towards the head. This is the mid pole, and this is the lower pole of the kidney over here. So when we roll the patient decubitus, left lateral decubitus, we put the probe on their back between the ribs. Well, now we can see the kidney stretching out here in its long axis, and there's no liver in the window here. It's just straight up kidney and we can actually see how close the kidney lies to the skin line, about two centimeters deep to the skin on this particular patient when we do a posterior approach. Now, the left kidney is uh, more towards the head and more towards the bed. What do I mean by that? It's more superior and it's more posterior. More superior meaning more towards the head, more posterior meaning more towards the bed. And you'll notice that this is the tip of the spleen here. It's a little smaller than the liver, and so that tip of the spleen kind of stops right here, so we lose the rest of this kidney when we're taking that coronal approach. So what we need to do many times on the left kidney is get more posterior on it, come around the back a little bit more, and you'll, you'll realize that today at the bedside trying to find those left kidneys. What's common in the kidney is to see a little separation here between the kidney and either the liver or the spleen. And this hyperechoic separation that we're seeing here is just straight up perinephric fat. Now this is visceral body fat. We see it around the kidneys, we see it around blood vessels, we see it around the heart, and you can't look at somebody and predict whether or not, based on their body habitus, they're going to have a lot of visceral fat. So somebody could be like really skinny and still have a perinephric fat pad like you're seeing there, and vice versa. So we don't really control that very much by our diet and stuff. It's just kind of there. We're going to change gears now and talk about the bladder. We're going to move from the kidney and skip the ureters because we can't see them, and we're going to go down to the bladder, okay? And we're going to talk about the physiology of the bladder, some of the scanning techniques we use to look at it. Bladder jets, as you're seeing here, this is a grayscale image of the bladder jet. 
from the ureter into the bladder. And then we're going to talk about a little clinical correlate that we're going to do with suprapubic catheterization. Now, the urinary bladder is an amazing organ. It's, it's capable of tremendous amount of expansion and contraction. The muscle of the urinary bladder is known as the detrusor. It's called the detrusor, and it's made up of, of the smooth muscle that you can see here. And um, basically, it responds to the um, impulses of the autonomic nervous system and actually involuntarily contracts. And so the method in which the urine is stored and then eventually expulsed involves a complex extrinsic neural regulation mechanism. The storage component really relies upon the elastic and the muscular properties of both the bladder and the urethra, whereas the release component is really dependent on the voluntary neural mechanisms that you control with your brain and your spinal cord. Now, both these myogenic and the neurogenic, you can have dysregulation there, and that's where the bladder disorders can arise due to certain problems with metabolic conditions, neurologic conditions, trauma, medications, things like that. I'm not going to go into those details, but you can imagine how those things can come into play here and really mess up this delicate balance between storage and expulsion. And the other thing about the bladder is that its compliance is amazing. It relies on that viscoelasticity properties of the bladder while it's filling up. It can expand to 500, 600, 700 cc's. My record in my emergency department is a patient had 1,400 cc's of bladder in their, um, a urine in their bladder. And it's the inhibition of that detrusor um, action that occurs through some complex neural modulations that allows that bladder to uh, fill to those gigantic um, volumes. So the term micturation, uh, you may not have heard this before, it's a fancy word that means to urinate or to um, void, void your bladder. So voiding is the process of micturation or urination. Basically, it occurs through the combination of primarily urethral uh, relaxation and secondarily contraction of the detrusor uh, muscle. And after a patient voids, there should be little or no urine left in their bladder. The amount that's left in their bladder is termed the post-void residual, or PVR. So which transducer do we want to use to image the bladder? Well, keep in mind that, you know, when you increase the frequency, you get much better resolution at the expense of penetration. So when I want to look at somebody's bladder, um, the, usually it's in sort of a, a distant location in the body. It's not right up against the skin line like the way our blood vasculature is. So we need to use a probe that can have a low enough frequency to penetrate down into the body, and that's when we can use um, either the C60 or the P21. Now, I know most of our machines have the P21 on them, and it, it looks just fine for the bladder for what we need to use it for. Ideally, in an ideal world, the C60 looks a little bit prettier, though. It's got more crystals in it and things like that. Um, but if I needed to, I could actually use either one of those other two probes, too, though it wouldn't be the best way to do it. Intracavitary transducer, yeah, you can see the bladder from within the, um, the vaginal vault, but uh, it causes a lot of uh, artifacts because the curvature of this probe is so tight, there's a lot of artifacts that come off that. In fact, we always recommend that women have a completely empty bladder whenever we do an endovaginal ultrasound. And unless somebody's really thin or they have a really full bladder, it would be hard to see the bladder with the L38, um, especially in an average size or larger uh, format human being. Now, there's two views of the bladder that we do, the transverse view and the sagittal view. Transverse indicator to the patient's right, sagittal indicator to the patient's head. And I'm going to go back to this image here, and you can see that um, I've got the probe sort of here looking below the umbilicus, right down here. And to be honest with you, this isn't the actual location of the bladder. Um, what you need to do, actually, in our patients, um, unless the patient is completely like doesn't have any clothes on, then you could drag the probe a lot more inferior. So the bladder is actually down here. But in all our patients we're doing this on in our models today, you know, they're not butt naked. So what happens is we end up putting the probe a little bit higher than where the bladder is. So to compensate for that, what we need to do is actually tilt the probe this way, sending the sound inferiorly down here, which, which is really where the bladder is. It's like all the way down by the pubic symphysis. That's how inferior or downtown the bladder is. Same thing with the sagittal view. We're going to need to take the cable and like rotate the cable this way to get the sound to shine down inferiorly. Does that make sense? Okay. 
And that's why I kind of drew this diagram to show you how flat the probe can be um, in order to see the bladder. And this is what it looks like in the female pelvis. We've got this uh, nice full bladder, rectangularly shaped uh, bladder, and we look posterior to it. And this is actually the uterus down here. It looks like a little koala bear face with the ear over here of the, of the ovary. And people always ask me, can you see the ovaries transabdominally? And my answer is almost always no, although occasionally you get a very thin female with almost no body fat here. Um, it has got a nice full bladder and a very anterior ovary. And there's sometimes you do get lucky there, especially if there's a cyst on the ovary. Uh, but generally speaking, you really do need to use the endovag probe if you're looking at ovaries. This is what the male pelvis looks like in somebody who's got a pretty generous what? Prostate. So the prostate takes the location of the uterus in the male. And that's what that kind of looks like there. Now, in the sagittal plane, um, you're going to have the indicator towards the patient's head, and you can have that probe just superior to the pubic symphysis. You're going to be fanning side to side looking through the bladder. So this is, first we look at this male's pelvis in a transverse view. We're fanning superiorly and inferiorly in that sagittal, in that transverse view, and then we flip it over to sagittal, and now we're looking at the bladder in a sagittal view. The bladder looks a little bit more triangular shaped, um, though not as much as it does in the female pelvis, but that's the idea. You start transverse, and you fan through it, and then you go sagittal. Now, in the female anatomy, things get a little bit more complicated. First of all, in the upright female, this patient's standing straight up, um, the pelvis itself is tilted back at 45 degrees, okay? So we already have that bit of sort of complicating angle going on. And then, if you look at the angle between the vaginal vault, which is right here, and the antiverted uterus here, you've got another angle. You've got a 90 degree angle between the antiverted uterus and the vaginal vault. You combine that angle with the fact that the patient's tilted back at 45 degrees, and you can see how things can get pretty complicated. Now, this right here is the bladder, and you can imagine how as this bladder starts to fill with urine, it will start to expand and take the uterus and actually push the uterus that direction. And so it changes the flexion of the uterus depending on how full this bladder is. The area between the bladder and the uterus is called the anterior cul-de-sac, or sometimes called um, the vesico-uterine pouch. It's a potential space for fluid to collect, but more commonly you'll see fluid back here in the posterior cul-de-sac, sometimes called the recto-uterine pouch, or known as the pouch of Douglas. This is the pouch of Douglas back here. It's okay. <laughs> First time you're hearing this stuff. Um, and in normal, in uh, women of childbearing age, every month one of the ovaries ovulates and pops out an egg. And what's and, and as that egg is growing in its follicle, about to ovulate, as the follicle's growing, I should say, fluid is inside that follicle. The egg pops out, the fluid um, rests in the pelvis in a dependent location, which is the posterior cul-de-sac or pouch of Douglas. So it's normal in the female pelvis to see some anechoic fluid kind of rolling around back here in women of childbearing age. It's always abnormal, though, to see that in a male pelvis. This is what it looks like on ultrasound, the transabdominal sagittal anatomy. We can see the bladder looks very triangular shaped now. This is the fundus of the uterus out here. This is all the fundus of the uterus. This is the cervix down here, and this is the vaginal stripe right here, okay? Now imagine that the uterus is sort of a light bulb shaped structure, and then down here at the bottom of the light bulb, that's where the cervix is. So this is where the glass part is over here, and the cervix is down here, and that's the part that you twist into the light. Okay, that's kind of how I think of the, the uterine anatomy and the cervix. Now, this hyperchoic line, this white line that you see right here, that's the vaginal stripe. That's actually the walls of the empty vagina all cave down on itself, and you get an echogenic line like that. Okay, so going from the outside world into the vaginal vault, you terminate at the cervix, and then you have this sort of 90 degrees where the uterus comes off that way. That's the anatomy there. It's a little confusing at first, but over time it makes sense. Now, if I took the intracavitary probe or the endovaginal transducer and I insert it into the vaginal vault, I would eventually come to the cervix. And when I land on the cervix, that's when I stop inserting the probe and the sound comes out over this whole area right here. And I get really high res pictures of the uterus and the pelvic contents because I've got that high frequency transducer. So I'm just kind of throwing this all out there for anatomy and stuff. This is what it looks like here with the schematic on there. And here's the labels. We can see the vaginal stripe comes in and terminates at the cervix. Here's the antiverted uterus. This is the anterior cul-de-sac or vesico-uterine pouch. This is all the posterior cul-de-sac back here. 
pouch of Douglas, sometimes called a recto uterine pouch. You can see all this in the transabdominal sagittal anatomy. This is a woman with an empty bladder. Look how retro, I'm sorry, look how flexed the, the uterus is. You see how it's like 160 degrees coming all the way back on itself, almost 180 degrees at some points. See that? So the vaginal stripe comes in here and then it turns around, does almost a 180, comes back towards the fundus of the uterus up here. As this bladder fills up, it's going to push that uterus that direction. Now, artifacts, um, keep in mind that when you have the bladder, it's a low attenuating artifact. Sound loves to travel through the bladder, and when it does so, it speeds up, and everything behind it becomes hyperechoic, okay? So that's a good thing, but sometimes you get to turn down that far field gain because things are too overgained back here, okay? So you need to, you want to use the bladder as your window to see the pelvis, but sometimes if you want to see structures behind the bladder, you get to back off on that far field gain. Another type of artifact is called reverberation artifact or reverb, which is where you have equidistant bright arcs that come down from the transducer. We see, we see that a lot too with the bladder. We see these equidistant arcs coming down here from um, through this bladder here. We see that a lot um, when we're looking at the bladder. Now, you can measure, you can sort of estimate the volume of the bladder by using the equation width times height times length. And here's a situation where we, in a transverse plane, okay, so this is to the patient's right, this is to the patient's left, we measure the width using our calipers, and then we, you know, pop that number into our iPhone calculator, and then we, or whatever calculator you have, and then you take the height, so here's anterior, here's posterior, and then you get those two values, and then you unfreeze the machine, and then you rotate the probe into a sagittal plane, okay? In a sagittal plane, what was once the width is now the length. I'm going to say that one more time because that confuses a lot of people, okay? Over here in a transverse plane, this is the width of the bladder. We then rotate the probe into a sagittal plane and what used to look like the width is now the length of the bladder in a sagittal plane, okay? So if you can, if you got that, if you followed that, you're good to go. If you didn't follow it, go to iTunes U later tonight and you'll hear this lecture all over again. This is how we measure the bladder. This is a transverse plane of the bladder. It looks really kind of squared off here. It's pretty full. Um, they're going to measure first the height of the bladder in this transverse plane. From here to here is the height. And then eventually, um, they, um, in this particular software, it, it's able to lock to, you can, and some of the machines you can lock in the, the values and, and the machine will do the calculation for you. So they measure the height. Now they're measuring the width in the transverse plane and then they're going to unfreeze the machine and they're going to go to a sagittal plane. You'll see here now, they rotate the probe 90 degrees so they're in a sagittal plane and they delete the word trans and they write the word sag and then they're going to get a nice long sagittal plane of this. So they're going to freeze it and they're going to drop their caliper across the screen and that'll be the, the height times the width times the length and then as they do so, uh, you can see the volume is being calculated down here. It comes out to like 400 and I don't know, 37 cc's of urine. It's a lot of urine. So, um, the other thing that's cool about bladder ultrasound is the fact that we can see, especially using color Doppler or power Doppler, we can see the jets squirting through the trigone of the bladder. And, um, and you can look at those jets. You can actually count them up if you want. So here we see on power flow Doppler, the jet of the left ureter is firing into the bladder. You can see it Here's the left ureter diagram here. It came into the back of the bladder of the trigone, gave it a good fire, then we just saw the right one fire. And there goes the left one again. So this is using something called power Doppler. I didn't really tell you about that yet. I talked to you about pulse wave Doppler and color flow Doppler. Power Doppler is a very sensitive type of, of flow, and um, it's nice to use it on the bladder because it's so sensitive. You get some nice, you know, good um, signal there. Um, there's no directionality to it, but it is the most sensitive type of, of Doppler, power flow Doppler. And you can activate that toggle back and forth between power and color. And this is an example here of the sagittal female pelvis. We can see the uterus poking up over here. This is the bladder here. So this is the back of the bladder. We can see bladder jets sort of coming in and out uh, as this patient's making some urine there. There's a nice bladder jet there in the sagittal female pelvis. And then on grayscale alone, you can actually see the bladder jet sometimes as well. See there's a bladder jet there flowing in from the left ureter 
fired pretty good. If you overgain the image a little bit, sometimes you can see these um, these jets just on grayscale alone if you stare at them long enough. So um, if you really want to look at the bladder jets, the best way to do it is to have the patient have an IV in place, getting one or two liters of IV fluid, you know, draining into their veins. That makes the kidneys kind of get to work and start making some jets. It helps even better if you give them 60 milligrams IV of caffeine. Then you get some really good jets like that one I did that I saw right there. Um, we're going to end this lecture with a clinical correlation. Uh, sometimes you need to, there's two ways to put a catheter into a patient, into their bladder. One is through the urethra, the most common way, but occasionally because of trauma to the, to the urethra, for example, we need to put a catheter in through the skin right above the bladder itself. That's called a suprapubic bladder catheterization. We go through the skin itself. It's actually called a percutaneous. Whenever you go through the skin, it's called percutaneous. So what he did here is we took a needle and we put it right through this skin and some of this fat here in the muscle. And you can see the needle tip. Do you guys see that needle tip right there in the bladder? Once you get the needle tip into the lumen, lumen means the inside of a structure, whether it's in the lumen of the bladder, lumen of the vessel. Once you get the needle tip in the lumen of this bladder, you take a guide wire and you thread it through the inside of the needle until it goes into the lumen of the bladder. And then you could take the needle out of the bladder. And if you look down at the patient's belly, they just have this guide wire dangling up in the air, okay? Then you take a, a dilator and you thread it over the guide wire and you can dilate out a track through the skin, okay? Then you take the dilator out and then you can put a catheter over the guide wire and then you can take the guide wire out. And so now you've got a catheter inside the bladder. And that technique, putting a guide wire through a needle, taking the needle out, putting a dilator over the guide wire, and then a catheter over the guide wire, and then taking the guide wire out, that technique is called the Seldinger technique. And we use it all over medicine, put lines in people and catheters and stuff. And so that's what we did to this patient. And on the next video here, you can see now their bladder's a lot less urine in it. And at the end of the catheter, we blew up a balloon using saline so we can blow up a balloon that holds the, the, the catheter in place. So by holding the catheter in place, by blowing up that balloon, we keep it held in place so it doesn't fall out. Okay? So this is a 66-year-old guy who comes in. He had a Foley catheter placed several days ago and was sent home. He returns to the ER complaining of urinary retention and that his Foley catheter is no longer putting out urine. The bladder ultrasound here shows that the catheter is in the correct location and that the balloon is inflated, okay? Because sometimes these catheters, believe it or not, can actually get into the wrong place. The patient can pull on it, they can twist the wrong way, and the balloon starts to go into the urethra and can get blocked and all kinds of things. But this one actually has the, the balloon is blown up inside the bladder. So the catheter is in the right spot, but what's the problem with the image? the depth is down to 22, right? So we need to decrease the depth. So we go ahead and do so. So here we've decreased our depth to 10 centimeters. And now the patient um, still complains of urinary retention, that the Foley's not putting out urine. And so we said the next step is to just change the Foley catheter, right? So we go to take this Foley out. First thing we need to do is take the balloon down. But guess what? The balloon won't go down. The port that you hook up the um, syringe to to deflate the balloon, it's not working. And the patient is getting more and more agitated because his bladder's filling up, and he's like, hey, doc, get this thing out of me before I yank it out myself. And so you're, you're sitting here scratching your head. You're like, man, um, do I just walk away, let nature take its course, pretend I didn't hear him say that, or <laughs> do I figure out a way to solve this problem? So you go. we went back in the room, and... Um, here we can see his, his balloon here, and I thought about the suprapubic bladder and everything, and so I brought a needle down under ultrasound guidance, and I got on that balloon, see the needle on the balloon there, and then boom, we popped it, and then we're able to take the catheter out, and we you know we put a new catheter in there and flushed out all those pieces of balloon particle that's floating around in his urine, and um, got it out of there. But so that's the idea. That's the clinical correlate I wanted to leave you guys with. Basically, um, yeah, you had a question? Uh, he didn't feel it pop. He just, the, he, in fact, we, we pulled the Foley out. He still wasn't urinating. We had to put a new Foley in to, to get him to, to urinate. So, um, I mean, he felt the needle going through his abdomen, obviously. He wasn't too happy with that. But it wasn't, uh, we numbed the area up. It's actually pretty well tolerated. So 
Um, the kidneys are really easily visualized, actually. A anterior coronal planes, even posterior approaches. Today you'll be using um, all three approaches. You're going to be looking at the kidneys in two different planes, both longitudinal and short axis. Think about using ultrasound whenever you think about the bladder, and um, you can see the storage volumes. You can see the post-void residual, and um, of course, guiding suprapubic bladder catheterization. Like any other time when we take a sharp object and we put it in somebody's soft tissue, we can use ultrasound guidance for that. Thanks.